If you have your Bibles, join me in turning to the book of Isaiah. Also a book that's not in the familiar to us. Isaiah chapter 40. Or, I'm sorry, Isaiah 41. Uh, if you were here with us last week, you might have your bookmark still in that section because we were in Isaiah. Last week, you open up in the middle and you can probably find the book of Psalms. And it's a little bit to the right of the book of Psalms. It's one that is not real familiar to us. But it is a book of the Bible filled with prophecy. It's a book that Jesus quoted out of more than all the other books of the Old Testament. Uh, and speaking of the Old Testament, a reminder that the first Wednesday of every month, we have our Book of the Month Club. Uh, the first Wednesday at noon, uh, we meet together for a potluck lunch and we discuss uh, a book of the Bible. This month we're reading in the book of 1 Samuel. And so, uh, on the first Wednesday in September, we will answer any of your questions on 1 Samuel. And then we'll also do an overview of 2 Samuel. So if you can join us on that first Wednesday in September, it would be wonderful. Uh, I'll be back from vacation. We'll go on with that just as scheduled. Something that has characterized cultures, all cultures throughout history, is the presence of heroes. It seems that in every culture, we develop heroes. Whether it's John Wayne riding out against the, uh, the bandits, whether in modern, more modern culture, Luke Skywalker flying in on, on his mission uh, against the, to save the empire. We do it in sports, Michael Jordan leading the Bulls to what number of championship. We, we all have images of heroes. People who are larger than life, doing things thought impossible, and giving us a call to follow, giving us a call that we can follow them, and they'll bring us through. One of the reasons I think we focus on heroes is because deep down inside, each of us has this desire to be a hero for somebody else. Uh, especially little boys growing up. They always want to be the hero. The little girls dream about getting married in relationships. They get their Barbies and their Kens and they have play weddings. But little boys play Batman or Superman, uh, the Incredible Hulk. They run, run around the house grunting and rescuing people and doing these great feats. Because we want to come through and save the world. Another reason that we focused on heroes many times is the need for significance. One of the most compelling needs we face, far greater than the need for food or water, we each want to feel that there's some purpose in our life. We each want to feel that there's some significance, that we want to give ourselves to a cause greater than ourselves, even if it means great sacrifice. <coughs> We also focus on heroes because we never want to give up hope. We want to hold on to hope. You know, when do the heroes show up? Not during the cowboy Indian peace talks, but in the westerns, it's always at the last minutes. The, the wagons are surrounded. They're, they've only got 10 more rounds of ammunition. And things look hopeless. And then suddenly you hear the cavalry coming across. And, you know, here is, when you pick your cowboy hero, whichever cowboy movie you grew up watching. But uh, that's when hope comes, when all hope is gone. This morning I would say that God is a God who loves heroes. Not to make the hero seem great, but that so God will be magnified in our eyes. When we get in desperate situations, when we get in situations where it seems like all hope is gone, God loves to provide a hero so that we will say, isn't our God great? When you think back through history of the Bible, Old Testament, you see a hero after hero. Abraham, uh, Lot, his nephew, gets captured. Nobody can go against this big, massive army of five kings. Abraham says, I'm going to go get my nephew. He takes the servants in his own household. 
talks to his friend Amorit, and, and he brings his servants, and they get their own little army. They go off, they fight the battles, and they bring home everybody again. Abraham is the hero. Joseph, if you like Rocky movies, you know, Rocky is there, he's the boxer, he's getting the snot beat out of him, he's, you don't think he's going to be able to get up again? And that's when his trainer says, no, oh, no, he's just getting angry, he's just getting ready to fight. You think there's no possible way, and of course Rocky comes back and he wins the fight. Uh, Joseph is like a Rocky movie. You know, he's betrayed by his brothers, he's, they want to kill him, now they change their mind, they sell him off. He's taken down to Egypt. He serves as a, a slave in Potiphar's house. He's faithful in temptation. Potiphar's wife comes, tempts him sexually, and he says, no. He says, fine. Joseph, rent me! He's thrown in jail. He sits there rotting away in jail, and he's got here two, two of Pharaoh's <coughs> officials come down, and he interprets dreams. He says, you're going to get out of jail. Remember me to Pharaoh? They forget and Joseph is still sitting here in jail. Things look like desperate. Things look like there's no hope. When suddenly God brings Joseph out of jail, rises him to the second in charge in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself, in charge of all the administrations of Egypt, and spares literally the whole world. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Moses. Hear about the story this morning. Parting the Red Sea. Defeating the massive army uh, of the Pharaoh's army that came after him, God wipes him out in the Red Sea. Gideon. Gideon fighting the Midianites. Uh, here's this massive Midianite army attacking the Jews, oppressing the Jews. Gideon gathers the army together. God says, you've got too many people. Send them home. God comes back. you still got too many people. Gideon comes with just an army of 300 men. They wipe out Midnight army. Samson, the strong man, defeating the Philistines time after time after time. Uh, they try binding them to the gates. He just picks up the city gates and walks off with them on his back. Uh, they tie him to the pillars. And he just pushes the pillars out. The whole temple falls down, killing Samson and all the Philistines as well. David, another hero. We think of David, the shepherd boy. Uh, the baby of the family, just like me. And uh, when he goes to face a nine foot nine inch giant Goliath, you think about the, the height of the ceiling here, about the top of that slide. Goliath would have seemed pretty impressive, and David might not. David would probably be much shorter to the top of the screen. Very staggering to think about going against a giant like that. In fact, nobody wanted to face Goliath. David comes up on the scene. And he says, is there not a cause? He says, this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth that the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. God's focus on heroes is not to magnify the hero, but it's to show the power of God is great. And that no matter how bad the situation gets, there is always hope. <laughs> Last week we looked in uh, Isaiah 36. We saw that in spite of the surrounding Assyrian army, the Jews were all holed up inside the city of Jerusalem. Massive armies circling the city. A desperate situation, no hope. But God sends his angel down and in one night, 18600 186,000 men were killed. And the Jews were rescued. In one night. So many times we give up hope, but God loves to provide hope for His people. Today we're going to sort of look at a, a quick overview of the second half of Isaiah. Talking about how God loves to provide His people hope. Isaiah is a book we don't read a whole lot, but it's one that has a lot of wonderful truth in it. And we're going to sort of do an overview of a lot of it today, talking about how God provides hope for his people. The first thing we see in Isaiah is that God provides hope through earthly helpers. Heroes, if you will. 
God loves to raise up earthly helpers to come alongside us and provide hope. Uh, a setting uh, for the book of Isaiah that the Jews remember David and Solomon his son, Rehoboam, nation split, northern half, southern half. Northern nation of Israel, southern half of Judah. Israel is wiped out in uh, 722 BC. The Assyrians come down and wipe them out. The southern kingdom of Judah fell, falls uh, a number of years later, 586 BC. But God in Isaiah's day, in 722 BC, in that time frame, in the mid 700s, provides hope for his people. And one of the ways he does that is Isaiah writes down in his book prophecies that will come true 150 years later. 150 years beforehand, Isaiah prophesied that God would raise up a leader to overthrow the Babylonians. So Isaiah, if you picture a timeline, Isaiah is writing in the 700s, or reverse it, Isaiah, Isaiah is writing in the 700s, 600s, 500s, in the 500s is when this leader is going to be raised up, by the, in the 500s. A couple hundred years before Isaiah writes, and look at what he writes in Isaiah 41, in verse 2. Isaiah says that, first of all, that God's going to raise up a great deliverer. Isaiah prophesies that judgment is coming. God is going to exile the people out of their nation, out of their homeland, out of the promised land because of their sin, because of the idol worship. But Isaiah says, but one day when you turn back to God, when you turn from your sinfulness, when you cry out for deliverance, God will raise up a hero. Isaiah 41 verse 2. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind-blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. See, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Stick with me a little bit. Isaiah is a hard book to get through. We're just doing an overview. But first thing is, a couple hundred years before, God says through Isaiah, I'm going to send a deliverer. Now, if you look in chapter 45, verse 1, the page forward, chapter 45. Babylonians thought they were undefeatable. Nobody's going to be able to defeat us. The Jews were here in exile. They were in captivity by the Babylonians. But a couple hundred years before, God says, you know what? I'm going to send a deliverer. I'm going to give him the power to conquer armies. Here in chapter 45, we see God even calls him by name. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. God, 200 years before, calls him by name. To Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places. So that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. When the Jews were overthrown, the Babylonians came down to the southern nation of Judah. 586 B.C., they laid waste to the city of Jerusalem. But for these Jews who had gone off to Babylon... Isaiah has written a prophecy of hope that God would send the deliverer. The deliverer's name would be Cyrus. And Isaiah writes in chapter 44, verse 28, that Cyrus will actually rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Chapter 44, verse 28, who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. 
He will say in Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. And then if you page forward to chapter 45, verse 13. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. But not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. So God promised a couple hundred years beforehand that Cyrus would come to power. He would be the deliverer. He would rebuild the city. And the city was rebuilt. When we look in the book of Ezra, we've gone through the book of Ezra before as a congregation. In Ezra 1.1, even though it's before uh, Isaiah in the order, it actually takes place later. It says, Ezra 1, 1, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. So Isaiah prophesied beforehand, even though you're going to go into exile, there's hope because God's going to raise up a hero for you. A deliverer. He's not even going to acknowledge me. He's not going to be a Jehovah worshiper. But I'm going to, I'm going to pick him out of the nations. From Persia, who was not even up wasn't even on the map as a world power at the time. Isaiah writes and says his name is going to be Cyrus. And you know what? He's going to take you back and he's going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem that's going to be sacked. <coughs> Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. But under Cyrus, just like Isaiah prophesied, the city was rebuilt. God has given the people hope in this hero. Another hero at the time was Daniel. We read the book of Daniel and we see here is Daniel, this uh, young Jewish prince who is taken to Babylon. And in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, administration, he rises up to prominence to where he is one of the king's key advisors. And for all the Jews out in the concentration camps, feeling like there's no hope, they say, but you know what? God is Daniel right there leading in the city. How long is Daniel leading in Babylon? Daniel 121 tells us. And Daniel remained there until the, the first year of King Cyrus. So God has raised up heroes for his people to give them hope. Uh, this was back in 541 BC that Cyrus comes to power. And years after Isaiah had written, I Isaiah knew in advance God had revealed to Isaiah all of these things. Abby, I'm going to skip ahead down here a little bit. Mm -hmm. God gives his people hope. Number one, through earthly leaders. Secondly, God gives his people hope through forgiveness of sin. The Jews have understood that they are where they are because of their sinfulness, because of their idol worship. Isaiah has prophesied in the first half of his book, you are going to face judgment because of your sin. But in the second half of the book, Isaiah reminds the people that God is a God full of forgiveness. Chapter 40, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Isaiah writes, Comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You page forward to Isaiah 48, verse 17. Isaiah 48, verse 17. And once again, Isaiah writes words of comfort to the people. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, 
your righteousness like the waves of the of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand, your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be cut off nor destroyed from before me. God lets us know, his people know years before, that he will forgive them for all the sins, for the punishment that he brought upon them. God offers forgiveness. How does he do this? Through Jesus. Through the promised Messiah. And Isaiah is one of the books that's quoted so much because it tells so much about our Messiah, Jesus. 700 years before he ever comes, God gives his people hope through the coming Messiah. Isaiah prophesies of one who would come, who would be assigned to all nations. A very familiar verse in Isaiah 7, a verse we read at Christmas time. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Another Christmas verse, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us the child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, Isaiah writes many times in his book about this promised Messiah. Uh, if you're in Isaiah, page forward to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah writes so much about this Messiah. Here in Isaiah 53, uh, verses 2 and 3, speak about Jesus having a very humble life. He writes, it says, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Contrary to popular opinion, Jesus was not the light of the party. People love to throng around Jesus, but not because he's this great, handsome man. He wasn't athletic, overly athletic. He didn't win all the races. It says here in Isaiah, there, there's nothing special about him physically. He had a very humble life. Verse 4 in Isaiah 53 speaks about his healing ministry on the earth. It says, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Over in Matthew 8, it tells us in the story of Jesus, it says, when evening came, many were demon-possessed were brought to him, to Jesus. And he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. So this promised Messiah, this promised deliverer that Isaiah writes about, is one who brings, as a healer, brings physical healing. But he also brings spiritual healing, forgiveness of sins. We come down to Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. It speaks of spiritual healing. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Go on in verses 7 to 9. It speaks of his trial and crucifixion. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like the lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And as we go through the book of Isaiah over and over and over again, Isaiah gives us these prophecies about the Messiah, about Jesus. Why does he do this? To give us hope. That there is forgiveness. It comes through the promised deliverer, the promised deliverer of God, the Messiah. <laughs> And the fourth thing we see about God giving his people hope is that God gives his people hope through a true vision of God. In uh, back to Isaiah 40. Isaiah writes here, reminding the people that our God is far greater than all these idols that the other nations worship. The Jews were sent away in exile, into captivity, because they wanted to be like the people around them and worship these idols. 
whether it be Baal or Ashtoreth or Moloch or Dagon, uh, they all crafted these idols that they would worship. In Isaiah 40, verse 18, Isaiah writes and says, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare it to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. Man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot and looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. When you go out and get these idols, you're just getting wood and you're getting metal and you're, you're worshiping a piece of wood. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. What do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. When we understand that we serve the one true God, the God of all creation, the God who knows every problem we face and has the answer, has the strength, has the power to meet our every need. We find there is hope, no matter how bad the situation. So, we, we've thought here about the book of Isaiah. Pretty much the second half of the book of Isaiah gives the people hope. But the same things we see in Isaiah are true for us today. So very quickly, if I lost you in Isaiah, let's think about the four principles of Isaiah and look at it in our own way. Number one, God uses others to help us have hope. Sometimes our, our culture is one of isolationism. We want to do it all ourselves. No, no, I don't need your help. I'm fine. I'm fine as it is. But God provides hope for us through bringing others along silence. We understand that all the lessons in the Old Testament, we talked about this last week, are given to us to give us hope. And so we, we look at the lessons of Isaiah and we say, you know what, that's true for me as well. God uses others to give us hope. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill all Christ. Christ says, you know what, here's my law. Care for one another. Bible says, I think it's in uh, Thessalonians, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. We come alongside one another and we encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are. What gives us hope in our life today? Brothers and sisters who come alongside us, when we're struggling, when we weep, when, when we need somebody to talk to, somebody to pray with us, God brings <laughs> that person to give us hope. In the Old Testament, uh, remember in the story of David, David is running for his life. King Saul is trying to kill David because he knows David has been anointed to replace him as king. And David's best friend is the Saul's son, Jonathan. Jonathan comes out to David in the wilderness. And Jonathan doesn't come out and say, don't worry, David, it's going to be okay. 1 Samuel 23, 16 says, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Orish and helped him to find strength in God. And that's what we are to do as well. 
We don't come along to somebody and say, oh, don't worry, everything's going to work out fine. The way we give others hope is we say, let me pray with you. You know what? You know, I, I'm going to pray for you each day. This is the big issue you're going through. Let me pray with you. You know what? We have a great God. Let me tell you how God worked in my life in the past. We give each other hope. Not just by saying, oh, everything's going to be fine, but by pointing others to Christ. And say, you know what? Our God can help us. God gives us hope. Number one, by bringing others alongside us. Secondly, God offers us hope by giving us forgiveness of sin. We understand that God gives blessings for obedience. We saw that in Isaiah. I, Isaiah wrote and said, you know, if you had followed God, you, all these blessings would have been yours. We understand the same thing in our life today. When we faithfully follow God, there's a great blessing for obedience. Ephesians 6 verse 7 says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he's slave or free. We understand that one day each of us will stand before God will give an account for the things we've done. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done by the body, whether good or bad. You say, well, that does sound very good to have to stand before God to judge of all the earth. But really, it does. That is there to give us encouragement and hope. Think of a child who's constantly pushing the line and the parents let the kid do anything he wants. How does that child feel? He doesn't feel loved. He feels unloved. My parents don't care. I can get away with anything. They don't care about me. <coughs> but with our God, because He loves us, because He wants the best for us, He places boundaries. He says, these things are off limits because that will hurt you. And because our God loves us, He wants us to learn that obedience brings blessing in our life. Sin brings consequences. But God knew that each of us needed forgiveness. And He gave His Son Jesus for us. Which in Isaiah, Isaiah presents hope through the Messiah. We know that Jesus is the promised Messiah of Isaac. And we understand that, that for us today, there is hope because we find strength through our relationship with Christ. Paul writes in Philippians 3, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. In our context today. You know that fancy new sports car I just bought? It's nothing. You know my great job? You know my family? My kids? It's nothing compared to my relationship with Christ. It's our relationship with Christ that should be the most meaningful thing in our life. Paul goes on in Philippians 3. He says, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. I'm not right with God because I keep the law and do, do the right thing. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Paul says, I, I am right with God because of Jesus. Because of the forgiveness I find in Jesus. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing His sufferings. Becoming like Him in His death and somehow to attain to the resurrection of what gives us hope is that personal relationship we can have with Christ. Sadly, there are many people in churches all across America today who go to, to church out of ritual, who have no relationship with Christ, who have never experienced His forgiveness. But we understand that in Christ we have a God and a friend who understands everything we go through. Weariness, temptation, desire, struggle. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, Jesus has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Mm -hmm. 
And because he went through all that temptation, the next verse goes on to say, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have hope because we know we can cast our every care on him because he cares for us. He understands what we're going through because he went through it too. But he can help us because he is God. We have hope in our relationship with Christ. And then the fourth thing we saw in Isaiah, which is true for us, we have hope when we see our God as he truly is. Our culture is one that's quick to dismiss God. The big man upstairs. All the jokes. You know, God is a man with a, the long white robe and the long beard, and he's halfway falling asleep all the time. And we have these false views of God. One of the biggest problems we face today is we do not see our God as he truly is. We serve a holy God. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am. We serve the God of all creation. No one compares to him. Isaiah has written, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. We serve a God who is so far beyond our understanding, but he is a God who cares about every detail of our life. Uh, after vacation, we're going to actually look at Isaiah 6 and see how the, the view Isaiah had of God and what that means for us. But for us today, what we've seen in Isaiah is true for us. That we have hope in our God. What, we have hope because God brings others alongside us. We have hope because we have a God who is full of forgiveness. We have hope because we have a God who has given His Son, Jesus. And we can have a personal relationship with our, our God. And we have hope because we have a holy God. A sinless God. A God who never gets tired. His ear is not heavy. He's never too tired to listen to us. You ever been on a phone marathon somewhere? After so long, your ear is so tired. Sit as I just got to go. Our God never says, i got to go. I'm busy. I don't have time. No matter how bad the situation we're in, we can always turn to our God. He's always there to hear. He's always there to Father, I thank you that we can come to you today, any time today, all throughout the day, and you will always be anxious to hear from us, ready to help us. You're there with all the answers we need. You're there to give us strength. You're there to give us comfort and encouragement. You're there to give us hope. I thank you for the others that you bring into our life. And I pray that you would use each one of us to be an encouragement to somebody else this week. And even today, may we look for opportunities to point others to Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your great forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your promised Messiah, Jesus, who, who understands all the temptations and struggles and burdens we face and invites us to cast our cares upon him. Thank you, Lord, for being such a great God. Help us, Lord, to have hope this week because of these reminders that you've given to us today. We pray in Jesus' name.